donated. All right. This morning, I am uh, continuing in my sermon series through Exodus. And before we dive into Exodus, I want to take us to Luke in the New Testament. You know, after Jesus' resurrection in Luke 24, there's this story that Luke records of two disciples walking on the road to a village called Emmaus. And these two disciples, they know Jesus has died, but they're not yet aware that Jesus has risen from the dead. And they're despondent as they walk and they talk about what happened to Jesus. And then Luke tells us that Jesus appears and walks among them, with them, but they're kept from recognizing Jesus. So they just think there's this stranger walking along. And picking up the text in verse 17, I just want to read a little bit of this passage. Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I highlighted that last line because it's very much a guiding principle for how we teach the Bible, how we read the Bible here at New Life, our understanding of the Old Testament in particular, that even though Jesus' name is never mentioned throughout the whole Old Testament, We believe that the whole of it speaks about him and proclaims him and points to him. Every story in there, just like Jesus said here, he starts with Moses and the prophets, and he walks them through the Old Testament, showing them how it all points to him, even though his name is never mentioned. It's like one of those movies, right? You watch, and then there's a twist at the end, and all of a sudden, everything that went before it, right, is seen completely different now that you know the ending. It's that same thing when you read and look back and you see Jesus all throughout the Old Testament. It all points to him. That's the miracle of the Bible. It's not that God gave us, you know, these incredible ethics or these interesting stories. It's that over all of these centuries, with all these different authors writing in all these different different places, that they all tell one common grand story, the story of God's salvation of the peop- his people and the world that culminates in Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. I mean, go back to where we've been so far in Exodus. The baby Moses, who was born to be a savior of his people, pointing us ahead to Jesus, who would be born to be the savior of the world. The angel of God in the burning bush that Moses sees, who is not the father, but he's like the father. He's a divine figure that Moses encounters, pre-incarnate, eternal son of God. The darkness that falls over the land during the plagues as God's judgment comes down on the Egyptians, pointing us to God's darkness that would come down as Jesus was dying on the cross, as his judgment fell on Jesus. The Passover lamb of God who was slain, the blood on the doorposts so that it would save the Israelites from death, pointing us to Jesus, the true lamb of God, who would be slain on Passover, on the cross, and whose blood would save us from death. The crossing of the Red Sea, as the Israelites cross, Israelites cross from slavery and death to freedom and life, as their enemy is destroyed, pointing us to our salvation as we go through the waters of baptism. We come out saved and free on the other side as our enemy is defeated. The gift of manna in the wilderness, bread from heaven that points to Jesus, the true bread from heaven, that if you partake of him, will give you eternal life. Again, the whole Old Testament, every story points to Jesus. It's not just lessons that are meant to be read and moral tales, you know, that you are meant to apply to your life. It's this grand story that all points to Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection that saves us from slavery to sin and the devil, leads us to freedom and salvation. 
and creates a new community of the people of God. So I say that all as prelude because we're going to look at a short story today, Exodus 17, 1 to 7, and you read it. If you're just reading it without that in mind, you'd say, well, just, okay, it's just an interesting story. But as you read it with Jesus in mind, you see how it's this picture thousands of years ago of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Exodus 17, 1 through 7. There we go. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. And so they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. I might need help with the clicker again, it looks like the slides. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel <clears throat> and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is God's word. Let me pray before we continue. Lord, help us to understand what this meant to the Israelites and what this means to us today. Just please lift our eyes up to see a grander vision of who you are and what you want to do in our lives and help us to be Submissive to whatever it is you want to do in our hearts today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so what is going on in this passage? Is it just a simple passage of God giving water to thirsty people, or is there more going on here? So you could divide this into three parts, basically. There's the charges, the verdict, and the, I'm sorry, the charges, the trial, and the verdict. So let's start with the charges here. The story begins with the Israelite community traveling through the desert and camping at Rephidim. And once again, they find themselves without water, just as happened a couple of chapters ago. And so they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. There's no asking. There's no politeness here, right? There is a simple demand that Moses give them water. And Moses replied in the next verses. He said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone us. Now, in the past couple stories we've looked at, they've grumbled against Moses. They've used this word grumbling against Moses, but now comes this word quarrel, which has a whole different connotation in the Hebrew. It comes from the word rib, which refers to a covenant lawsuit. Okay, What they are doing here is bringing charges against Moses, basically. They are accusing him of attempted murder, basically, saying, you have brought us out to this desert to kill us. You haven't provided water. You haven't provided food. You have brought us out here to kill us. They want Moses dead. They have brought him out for attempted murder, basically. And it says, as Moses says to God here, they are almost ready to stone me. In other words, that is how they would put someone to death back in those days. And he recognized they are ready to try him and kill him for attempted murder here. They've had enough of the desert. They've had enough of the lack of water. They want justice. They want Moses held responsible. But Moses recognizes that their quarrel is not just with him, right? I mean, their quarrel is with God, ultimately. It's not just that he hasn't provided. Their quarrel is with God. That's why he says, why do you put the Lord to the test? It's like in Exodus 16, verse 8, if you look back, this is when he said here in 17, 2, why do you put the Lord to the test? But last chapter, he also said that. He said, you will know it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat this evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. So again, again, if you've been listening to Exodus, you look back. Yes, he provided manna in the wilderness. He provided quail to them when they were hungry. He provided water, turning the bitter waters of Marah into sweet water for them. He delivered them from Pharaoh, parting the Red Sea, bringing them out of slavery, drowning their enemies. And yet, here they are once again, complaining and quarreling and bringing these charges against Moses, saying, we've had enough. 
we've had enough of this desert situation. We've had enough of your leadership. You can't provide water for us. We want you brought up on charges here for attempted murder. So next we have the trial. In verses 4 through 6, next verses. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go, and I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. So the people are ready to stone Moses for attempted murder here. And Moses is complaining to God, what am I going to do with these people? And the text doesn't bring out the full picture, but you can almost imagine just the, the noise and the chaos and the yelling and all, I mean, there's a million, you know, people here. There's a lot of people probably yelling and angry with Moses and angry with Aaron. And Moses is losing his cool, and he's at least going to God saying, what do I do with these people? They're ready to stone me. And God tells Moses to go in front of the people to take the elders along with him, who would be like the judge and the jury, I mean, not the judge, but the jury, the witnesses to the trial. Take the staff, which is the rod of authority. It's a symbol of God's authority here. And go stand there. And Horeb, in case you don't remember Horeb, that was actually ironically the place where God met him at the burning bush. So here they are, back where God first called him, with this trial about to happen. But then... Something unexpected happens here. God doesn't tell Moses to go be on trial, nor does God say these people are going to be on trial for their rebelliousness, for their complaining. Instead, it says, God says, I will stand before you by the rock, or in some translations, upon the rock at Horeb. Verses 5 through 7, the verdict. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the Israel, elders of Israel and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So again, this is not just a simple story about God giving water to thirsty people. This is a trial. The people have had enough of Moses and his leadership. They want him tried and convicted for attempted murder. They're ready to stone him. He cries out to God, what am I to do with these complaining people? God tells him, take the elders as the ju jury there, as the witnesses to the trial. Take the staff of authority here, and I will stand before you on the rock, by the rock, and then I want you to strike the rock, and when you do, water will flow out for these people. The rod of justice will come down, not on Moses, not on the people, but on God. Psalm 78, 15 to 16. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. Again, do you see Again, this is thousands of years before Jesus walked on the earth. And you can just picture Jesus on the road to Emmaus with these two disciples, walking them through the whole Old Testament and saying, look at this and this and this, how it all pointed to me. All these shadows that point to the real thing here. All these signs pointing to the gospel. These complaining, miserable people who do not have faith in God, who cannot remember for more than a few days that God will provide and protect and care for them. And Moses complaining and losing his cool with them. And God here saying, I will take the justice, the rod of justice. I will bear the punishment and I will feed them and give them water in the desert. After World War II and when the concentration camps and, and, and Nazi party was all said and done, there came this play that was written by a German playwright named Gunter Rutenborn. It's a play entitled The Sign of Jonah, which was first published and came to America in about 1960. And the play was about the people in post-war Germany trying to come to terms with who was to blame for the Holocaust and the atrocities of the war. And in the play, there's these various members, and they're arguing back and forth and trying to say, oh, no, this person's to blame, the soldiers, the citizens who did nothing, it's the politicians, and they kind of 
argue back and forth about this, and they all say, well, it wasn't me. I was just following orders, and it wasn't me. I was, I was just a citizen. I didn't do anything, and it wasn't the industrialists. They, we were just producing what they told us to produce. And then finally, it all comes to them and says, you know who's really to blame for all of this? God is to blame. God must be put on trial. It's his fault. The Holocaust, the atrocities of war, all this evil in this world, it's his fault. He's the one in charge here. And this is how the, the story goes. I'll just, if we can just go to the next slide. There we go. Judge, you have heard the accusations. I command you to inform God of the verdict. How shall we phrase it? Man, God shall become a human being, a wanderer on the earth, deprived of his rights, homeless, hungry, thirsty, in constant fear of death. Woman, he shall be born to a woman somewhere along a country road, and the moans of other poor creatures shall ring in his ears day and night. He shall be surrounded by the feeble, the sick, the filthy, by a people hearing marks, bearing marks of leprosy. Rotting corpses shall bar his path. He shall know what it means to die. He himself shall die, man, and lose a son, and suffer the agonies of fatherhood, the queen. And when at last he dies, he shall be disgraced and ridiculed. Next slide. Judge says, go then, inform him of the verdict rendered by a tortured humanity. And the angel Gabriel, I, Gabriel, shall go to a country ruled by cruel, parasitic men, a divided land occupied by a foreign power. I shall go to a virgin named Mary. She shall bring God into the world under suspicion of shame and as a Jew. And then the angel Michael says, I, Michael, shall order the heavenly hosts to let him walk the earth unprotected. And when he falls to his knees, when the curse of being a man sends sweat dripping from his brow like drops of blood, I shall grant him sufficient strength only that he may go on suffering. Shall console him as he consoled the faithful, putting them off with promises so that they can bear more suffering. And then Raphael, the angel, I, Raphael, shall be present when he sinks into death, and I shall stand by his grave and be the horror's holiest witness that God is dead. As you listen to this play and as the audience sits in silence at the end, it becomes clear that God has already served his sentence that all of this anger and blame that is cast on him, that he has already served his sentence, that he has already come down. Jesus, the eternal son of God, to be born to a virgin, to suffer among us, to be mistreated, to be crucified on a cross, to take the punishment that we deserved for our sins. As Isaiah put it in a prophecy thousands of years before the birth of Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Exodus 17 the people fed up with the desert and Moses' poor leadership, bringing charges against him for attempted murder. And God, instead of striking down the people or blaming Moses, takes the punishment on himself, stands upon the rock. The rod of justice comes down on him, and the water flows out for the people. And just in case you thought I was making that up, this is Paul in 1 Corinthians 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. <clears throat> they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. And here is Paul looking back and saying, that rock in the desert <clears throat> excuse me, that the water flowed out of that gave them life, that rock was Christ. That rock was Jesus. That all points to Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. Again, remember what he said in Luke 24. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. It all points to him. Jesus was crucified on that cross, crying out, I'm thirsty, so that we might be saved, that we might have eternal life, that we might not receive just water from a rock, 
when we're thirsty, but the water of eternal life. In John chapter 4, Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan woman at the well, and he says this. John 4, there we go. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See that? It's not just physical water that's going to help you when you're thirsty, but it is this spring of water inside of you welling up to eternal life. And then he says again in John chapter 7, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in them in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So this is that water, that eternal life inside of you, that river flowing from within you, he says, is my Holy Spirit that I will put in you. Again, think of the imagery. You have this rock you know, and the rod of justice strikes the rock, God upon the rock, and out of it flows living water from the rock. And you think again of the prophecy in Ezekiel where God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. There's that stone, that heart of stone, that heart of rock that you have that does not respond to God, does not know him, I will replace that with a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you. This fountain welling up to eternal life flowing out of you. This is the gospel way back in Exodus. Again, the Old Testament is not just meant to be read as these morality tales, right? Stories about how you're to act or not act. It all is one grand story pointing to Jesus about this holy God who takes the punishment we deserve and pours out his spirit for us that we might have eternal life, even in the desert. Let me just share three implications out of this passage then for you. The first is this. Our complaining reveals our lack of trust in God. Let's just talk about complaining for a second, shall we? Again, the Israelites may have thought they were just bringing charges against Moses, but Moses knew they're not complaining against him. Their quarrel is with God, the one who raised up Moses, the one who sent him. Their quarrel is really with God himself. They're accusing God of not providing for them. They're accusing God of not protecting them. They're accusing God of not being present. They're accusing God of seeking to harm them. And again, despite all the evidence to the contrary, that he has brought them out of slavery, through the water, destroyed their enemies, given them bread, given them water. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, they still cannot stop themselves from complaining and arguing. We are not very different from the Israelites, are we? We are also very prone to spiritual amnesia. We have terrible memories when it comes to God and his provision for us and his protection and his love and his care and his presence. Or if I could just be charitable for a second to the Israelites, they did just come out of slavery. They spent their whole lives under the tyrannical rule, tyrannical rule of a slave master, right? They're not used to love and care and protection from those in charge over them. And so maybe God in his patience and gentleness with them just needs to remind them again and again and again. I love you. I'm here for you. I will care for you. I will protect you. I'll provide for you. I will not harm you. I'm not here to kill you. But like the Israelites, so often we turn the tables on God and we find fault with him, complain to him or about him, quarrel with him, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called God in the Dock, and he put it this way. If you're not British, the dock is where the criminal sits in the courtroom. It's not a place where the boats are kept. <laughs> he said this, the ancient man approached God as the accused person approaches his judge. But for the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dock. 
and he is quite a kindly judge, if God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war, poverty, and disease, that he is ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal, but the important thing is that man is on the bench and God in the dock. It's an interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? <laughs> that that's how the modern person approaches God, right? He needs to explain himself. He needs to justify his actions, why he allows such things to happen. He's on trial. We're the judge, and maybe we'll acquit him if he has a good explanation. Because that's not the way it works. God is the judge. We are in the dock. We are the ones who are guilty. So again, what does your complaining and grumbling reveal about your view of God, about his presence, about his protection, about his provision? We could be so quick to forget God's goodness to us. I don't know if any of you journal or find any other way, but it can be helpful, right, to do, find some way of commemorating God's goodness in your life, God's provision, God's protection, God's answers to prayer, something so that when you find yourself in the desert and you're prone to grumbling again and you're like, where are you, God? I don't understand what you're up to. You can look back and say, okay, all my life God has been faithful. All my life he's been good, right? Remind me again, of who he is and what he's done and what he's promised so that I don't end up like the Israelites, grumbling and complaining, quarreling with God. As the psalmist put it in Psalm 95, 7 through 9, today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. Do not harden your hearts. Second implication from this passage is this. Oops, sorry. Sometimes it works. God shows us his character at the cross. Again, this story of God upon the rock with a rod of justice and the water flowing out is meant to point us to the cross, the ultimate display of God's love. There's a great quote from A.W. Tozer where he said this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, that one you may need to go and journal about sometime this week, right? What do you think about when you think about God? Is he a loving father who cares for you? Is he a tyrannical ruler ready to strike you whenever you screw up? Is he your buddy, you know? Is he far off somewhere in space, just unapproachable? Who is God? What comes to your mind when you think about him? And at Meribah, God showed them that instead of punishing them, he was a God willing to take the punishment they deserved, to be forgiving, to be merciful, to be graceful, to pour out water for them to drink. And at the cross is where we see God's character on display the most as Jesus, the Son of God, lays down his life for us. As it says in Romans 5, 6 through 8, we see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is Paul saying, when you look at the cross, I want you to see love. I want you to see the love of God. That when you were a rebel, when you were ungodly, complaining and quarreling and rebellious against God, he gave his life for you to take your sin, to take the punishment you deserve, to give you eternal life. And if you've never re read Romans chapter 8, that is of all the chapters in the Bible, the one that truly displays who God is and his character. And I want to just read verses 28 to 39, all the things you see in here about who God is and his character beginning in verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies, which means declared not guilty. Who then is he, the, the one that condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, how many promises do you find in that passage that are just anchors for you as you walk through the desert and you're not sure where God is and what to believe, this passage right here says, listen, God is always at work for your good, even when you can't see it. Always working to conform you to the image of his son. He gave you his son when you were his enemy. How much more, he says, will he give you everything that you need? You can trust him to provide. If he gave you his son, now that you're his beloved child, he will take care of you and give you what you need. No one can bring any charge against you. There's no condemnation because God has declared you not guilty in Jesus Christ. So no matter what anyone else says about you or even your own heart says about you, it's not true because God has declared you not guilty. He is, sees you as his beloved child, perfect in every way. He is now at the right hand of the Father praying for you, interceding for you so that any accusations come, he has got your back. And he says, nothing will ever separate you from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. At the cross, you see the character of God, that he is good, that he loves you, that he will protect you, he will provide you. And when you're in the desert and when you're thirsty and when you're struggling to go on and trust, look to the cross, remember the character, remember the goodness and love of your God. And then third implication is this, that God gives us his presence and power in his Holy Spirit. Because God does not just stand upon the rock and receive the rod of justice, but then he pours out water for the thirsty people. And, and Paul tells us that water, and Jesus tells us that water is the Holy Spirit welling up inside of us to eternal life. And that means when you're feeling dry spiritually, when you're feeling lost, when you're feeling confused, that you have access right now to God by his Holy Spirit, that stream of living water inside of you. You don't need to go looking for it out there somewhere else, but he is in you. You just need to go deeper with him. Again, remember what he said in John 4, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And John 7, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water, will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would later receive. When you are feeling lost and confused and spiritually dry, the answer is to go deeper. His Holy Spirit is in you, a water of life. His power, his presence is there for you to access. So again, this story, this short story in Exodus is a picture of the gospel thousands of years before Jesus is born. The complaining and grumbling people, the flustered leader, and God standing on the rock, receiving the rod of justice, taking the punishment upon himself, pouring out water of life for the people. Points us to Jesus, our merciful and loving God, dying on the cross for our sins, taking the punishment we deserve, pouring out his spirit into our hearts, that we might have eternal life. And it says that river of the water of life flows out from us like streams of living water, 
can I encourage you not just to drink upon that water, but to allow it to overflow to others around you. As he has shown grace to you, show grace to others. As he has forgiven you, forgive others. As he has given you life when you were struggling, may you bring life to others when they are struggling. Amen. Let me pray and then we're going to respond and worship. Lord, help us this morning to access your Holy Spirit. May you fill us up afresh with your living water. May we be nourished by your Spirit. As we look to the cross, as we see Jesus dying in our place, help us to trust that you are who you claim to be. Replace all the false images we have of you, God, with the truth of who you are. You are holy. You are just. You are loving. You are good. You are merciful. You are full of grace. And help us to trust you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond in worship.